All right. Thanks. So I'm uh, excited to tell you about uh, data independent uh, memory hard functions. Uh, I should mention this is joint work with uh, uh, colleagues that are collaborators at uh, IST Austria, Joel Alwyn and uh, Christoph. Um, so you might think it's a little bit odd to have uh, the title theory uh, in the slides at a real world crypto conference, uh, but let me uh, promise you this is about a very real world problem. Uh, so consider the problem of password storage. Uh, in particular, suppose that uh, an attacker manages to break into the server and steal the hash uh, value. Now he can try an offline attack in which he uh, compares the hash value against the hashes of multiple uh, passwords in a, in a large dictionary. Right? Uh, and these attacks are increasingly commonplace. Uh, so this was my wall of shame as of a couple years ago, and this is the wall that uh, just keeps growing and growing and growing. Uh, so now I can claim that billions of user accounts uh, have been, uh, been affected by these attacks. Uh, not only is this a common problem, it's an increasingly dangerous problem. Uh, so if you log into Amazon right now um, and search for the Antminer S9, uh, you could purchase this machine for about uh, $3,000. And this machine can compute uh, 14 trillion SHA-256 hashes per second. That's a lot of password hashes per second. My, my guess is that most user passwords are not going to stand up to, uh, to this level of attack. In particular, uh, this is what, uh, what the user password distribution looks like uh, at the moment. Uh, people continue to select weak passwords. Uh, you know, despite decades of warnings, uh, it's difficult to create and remember hard, high entropy passwords. Uh, so we seem to be stuck in a world where users continue to select low entropy passwords. So this motivates the goal of developing moderately expensive hash functions. So we have two kind of contradictory requirements here. We want a function that can be computed fast on your own personal computer. And we also want a function that's expensive for the adversary to compute even on customized hardware that he might uh, purchase, like that Antminer S9. Um, so one of the promising techniques to, uh, to achieve both goals is memory hard functions. In particular, memory costs tend to be equitable across different architectures. The cost of, uh, you know, building in a gigabyte of RAM on an ASIC is not dramatically lower than the cost of just purchasing a gigabyte of RAM for your personal computer. All right. So let me now introduce uh, data independent memory hard functions. Uh, First, let's talk about memory hard functions. All right, so the intuition, uh, what's a memory hard function? It's a function whose computation costs are dominated by memory cost. So to compute a password hash once, we want to force the attacker to lock up a large amount of memory for a long period of time. Um, so in particular, we'd like the attacker to lock up you know, all this memory, as opposed to just using hash iteration and locking up a very small uh, processing unit uh, for a short window of time. Um, so sCrypt is uh, one classical example of a memory hard function. Um, and the next talk will actually uh, uh, give some positive, uh, exciting new positive results for sCrypt. One of the downsides with sCrypt, though, is that uh, sCrypt induces a data-dependent memory access pattern. That means that the pattern in which memory is accessed depends on the sensitive user input, in this case, the user's password. Why is this a problem? Well, it means that uh, potentially the password is vulnerable to side channel attacks. Uh, for example, cache timing attacks. So a data independent memory hard function is simply a memory hard function whose memory access pattern does not depend on the secret user input. And in this case, uh, if we adopt a data independent memory hard function, then we don't have to worry about these side channel attacks. All right, uh, so formally, what is a data independent memory hard function? Well, a data independent memory hard function is defined by two things. Uh, directed acyclic graph G, which specifies uh, data dependencies during computation. And a compression function H, uh, which we'll treat as a random oracle in our analysis. So given a graph uh, as follows, uh, how do we compute this function? Well, the input is the password and the salt. Uh, the label of the first node is just the hash of the password in the salt. 
the label of an internal node is the hash of its parents. So in this case, the label of node three is the hash of label two and label one. And finally, the output of this function is the label of the last node, the sync node. All right, uh, so to talk about uh, computing uh, data independent memory hard function, we can use the language of graph pebbling. In this case, placing a pebble on a node means that we compute the corresponding data value and store it in memory. Uh, removing a pebble from a node means that we free that value from memory. And of course, our goal is to place a pebble on the last node, compute the final value. Of course, there are rules uh, that guide, uh, guide the pebbling. In particular, uh, we can't just place a pebble on the graph at any point in time. Uh, we can only compute a value if we have all of the dependent uh, data values in memory. Um, so we can only place a new pebble on the graph at time step i if at the previous time step we had pebbles on both of its parents. All right. And of course, the um, final requirement is that we have to finish pebbling this graph eventually. Our goal is to compute the output. All right, uh, so here's an example of pebbling. Uh, very simple, you start off with no pebbles on the graph. Uh, we can start off by putting a pebble on node one. Now we can place a pebble on node two. Now we can place a pebble on node three. At the same time, we might want to free up uh, these two values uh, to save memory. Now we can place a pebble on node four. And now that we have pebbles on nodes three and four, we can place a pebble on node five. All right, uh, pretty straightforward. All right, so recall that uh, our goal was to force the attacker to lock up a large amount of space for a long time. Um, so how do we formalize this requirement? Well, uh, the first attempt uh, is uh, space-time complexity. So we say that the space-time complexity of a particular pebbling strategy is just the number of pebbling steps multiplied by the maximum number of pebbles on the graph uh, at any point in time. This is kind of the space that you use. All right, so this is a nice, uh, nice notion and it has a rich theory, uh, but I claim that this is not an appropriate uh, metric for password hashing. Why do I claim that? Uh, well, the problem is for parallel computation, ST complexity can scale badly in the number of evaluations of a function. So suppose, for example, we have a function where we need a lot of space uh, initially to compute the function, uh, but we only need a lot of space for a very short period of time. So in particular, space uh, looks like this, uh, this blue curve. Uh, well, in this case, the ST complexity of the um, evaluation strategy is quite high. Uh, but if we wanted to evaluate multiple instances of the, multiple instances of the function, we could sim simply pipeline and evaluate multiple instances in parallel without increasing space-time complexity. In particular, there exist functions uh, where you can evaluate up to square root n uh, instances of the memory hard function without uh, increasing space-time complexity at all. All right, uh, so this uh, um, motivates the need for uh, cumulative complexity uh, as defined by Alwyn and Serbanenko. Um, cumulative complexity is just the integral under this curve. So it's the sum over all pebbling steps of the number of pebbles on the graph at that point in time. Uh, what's nice about this metric? Uh, well, a couple things. Uh, the first thing is amortization. So the cumulative cost of pebbling two independent instances of a graph is just two times the cost of pebbling one instance of the graph. So this means that the attacker's costs are going to scale with the number of password guesses that he wants to try. Um, all right, so uh, this is a nice metric. Uh, how does it work? Well, remember our previous pebbling here, what would the cost of this pebbling be? It's just one plus two plus one plus two plus one, or seven total. All right, uh, another reason why uh, this notion is nice is because there's a nice uh, equivalence established by Alwyn and Serbanenko again. Um, informally, uh, and at a very high level, uh, high pebbling complexity of G implies that the original memory hard function has high amortized memory complexity, um, right? So it's efficient uh, to just reason about the structure of the underlying graph uh, to think, it, to prove uh, security of the underlying IMHF. All right, uh, so that's cumulative complexity. Uh, 
since this is real world crypto, we'll move one step farther and actually introduce some uh, other constants that uh, theoreticians generally don't like to think about. Uh, in particular, uh, we not only have to allocate space to evaluate uh, the function, we also have to have some cores on chip uh, to evaluate this hash function. So here, uh, this constant R here is just uh, the space required to store a random oracle core on chip. Um, so at a theoretical level, um, you know, this doesn't change the asymptotics of, uh, of, the, of the function, uh, but uh, it'll bring us closer, closer to reality when we, um, when we evaluate these functions. All right, um, so now that I've told you uh, how, to, how to evaluate the security of a, an IMHF, uh, let's think about uh, pebbling algorithms. And uh, first of all, I want to think about uh, the pebbling algorithm which would be used by the honest party. Uh, we'll call this na the naive pebbling algorithm. And because the naive algor pebbling algorithm is run by uh, an honest party, uh, typically we expect this algorithm to be something that you could run on a sequential computer. Um, so the constraint is only one new pebble can be placed on the graph per round. The attacker uh, isn't doesn't operate under the same constraint, uh, but the honest party needs to operate under this constraint. All right, uh, so an example of a naive pebbling algorithm is just to pebble the graph in topological order, node one, node two, node three, et cetera, um, and never discard pebbles. Uh, so how long does this take? It takes n steps, and we have an average of n over two pebbles on the graph at each uh, point in time. Uh, so the expected cost, or uh, the commutative uh, energy cost is gonna scale with n squared. All right, um, so what does it mean to have an attack on a data independent memory hard function? Uh, well, we call an algorithm an attack. Uh, if the amortized complexity of computing, uh, computing this function is lower than the cost of the naive algorithm. Um, so an example here, suppose algorithm A evaluates five IMHF instances with total cost 100 and suppose that the naive algorithm costs 40. Uh, well, in this case, uh, the quality of our attack is just two. All right, so what, uh, what properties do we desire for a, an IMHF? Uh, well, for practical reasons, we want a graph with constant in degree. Uh, we also want to assure that any attack A has small quality, uh, less than or equal to C for some hopefully small constant C. Um, and we also want to ensure that the naive algorithm is uh, somewhat expensive. Um, why, uh, why do we want this third constraint? Uh, well, it tells us that memory cost should dominate. Um, and also remember that users are impatient. Uh, so n, the running time of the algorithm, is fixed. So we want to make uh, this function as expensive as possible given a bounded running time. Um, so we want to maximize cost for fixed, uh, fixed running time n. All right, uh, and we'll say that uh, um, a MHF is C ideal if it satisfies all three of these constraints for uh, some constant tau. All right, uh, so that's, uh, those are the desirable properties for um, an IMHF. Uh, now, uh, let me tell you about an attack on uh, existing IMHF candidates. Um, so in particular, uh, the main takeaway from the talk is that uh, there's a combinatorial property called depth robustness, uh, which completely characterizes uh, secure data independent memory hard functions. In particular, depth robustness is necessary and also sufficient uh, for building a secure IMHF. All right, uh, so what is this property, uh, depth robustness? Uh, well, a graph G is ED reducible if there exists a set a subset S of vertices, such that the subset has size at most E, and removing these nodes from the graph uh, reduces the depth of the graph to D. And by depth of the graph, I mean the length of the longest path uh, after, removing, after removing these nodes S. Um, and of course, if a graph is not uh, ED reducible, then we say it's ED depth robust. So a simple example here, here's a one, two reducible graph. That means we can delete one node and reduce the depth to two. Uh, pretty easy to spot here. Uh, just delete node three and it's easy to visually verify that any path has length two. 
All right. Uh, so now I claim that uh, we can attack any ED reducible graph. Um, how do we do that? Uh, well, the only thing we know about the graph is that it's ED reducible. Um, so as input, our attack is going to just take a uh, subset S of nodes, which reduce the depth of the graph. And the attack works in two phases, light phases and balloon phases. Um, and the goal of a light phase is to make a lot of progress, to pebble the next G nodes that we want to pebble. Um, and during a light phase, the intuition is that we're not going to keep many pebbles on the graph. Uh, we're going to discard almost every pebble from the graph except for nodes in S and uh, for, nodes, for pebbles on nodes of the parents uh, of the guys that we want to pebble in the next G steps. All right, uh, so we use a low memory and this phase lasts for a long time. G is going to be typically large. All right, uh, of course at some point we're going to run out of uh, um, run out of time and we're not going to have pebbles uh, on the parents of the next nodes that we want to want to pebble. Uh, so now we have to execute a balloon phase to recover all these missing pebbles. Um, and the key point here is that because the depth of the graph is, uh, is small, uh, we can execute a balloon phase and very quickly recover all of the missing values that we've previously discarded. Um, so a balloon phase is uh, expensive. Uh, we're going to be operating in parallel and placing a lot of pebbles in the graph. But the point is that it's over very quickly. Um, you execute for D steps and you recover everything that you've discarded and then you, uh, you continue on your way. All right, so our theorem is that uh, if your graph is ED reducible, then there's an efficient attack A uh, with uh, the following uh, complexity. Um, so this is a complicated term. Let's walk through each, uh, each component uh, bit by bit. Uh, well, we keep pebbles on the set S and the set S has size E. Um, so we're going to pay cost E times N to keep uh, E pebbles on the graph uh, for N rounds. Um, during the light phase, we also maintain pebbles on the parents of the next G nodes that we want to pebble. Um, so there's, uh, in degree is, uh, is delta, so we have delta times G uh, uh, parents, uh, and we keep these pebbles on the graph for n rounds again, um, so delta times G times n. Uh, and this last term here is the cost of a balloon phase. Um, so we need to compute, uh, execute n over G uh, balloon phases in total. Um, and the length of a balloon phase is uh, D rounds, and uh, the maximum number of pebbles on a graph during each balloon phase is just n, the number of nodes in the graph. Uh, so this uh, upper bounds uh, the cumulative uh, space complexity, and these last two terms uh, just uh, trust me, they're the cost of querying the random oracle. All right, uh, so we have this complicated looking bound. Uh, now if we tune parameters appropriately, uh, we get the following energy complexity. Um, and note in particular that if E and D are smaller than N, uh, that this gives us an attack, uh, right? This gives us an uh, algorithm to evaluate this function with costs uh, um, little o of N squared. In particular, uh, this is bad because we want to ensure that any attack uh, requires, uh, requires cost N squared. Okay. Um, so now we have an attack, a uh, generic attack on any uh, depth reducible graph. Uh, the question then is, are existing IMHF candidates based on depth robust DAGs? Um, so in this talk, I'll uh, consider a few uh, different uh, IMHF candidates. Uh, there's Katana, um, an entrant to the password hashing competition, which received uh, special recognition. Uh, there's Argon2, uh, the winner of the password hashing competition. Um, in particular, uh, Argon 2i, the data independent mode, is the recommended mode for password hashing. Uh, there's a newer proposal called balloon hashing, uh, and uh, the original paper had three variants. I think there's just one, one variant in the current, current proposal. Um, okay, but uh, in summary, the answer is no. Uh, none of these graphs are depth robust. Uh, so Katana is actually kind of maximally depth reducible. Um, so if I remove E nodes, I can reduce the depth to N over E. That's kind of as bad as it gets. Um, and a consequence of this is that the cumulative cost of computing uh, this IMHF scales as uh, 
oh, sorry, n to the 1.62. Uh, this is in the exponent here, not, uh, this isn't order one, uh, it's not constant time, but n to the 1.62. Um, all right, so, uh, so balloon hashing and argon QI are also depth reducible. Um, slightly better than, uh, than Catena, uh, but still depth reducible. Uh, and we get an attack uh, which has cost uh, scaling as n to the 1.71. Uh, the latest version of argon 2i is actually, a, seems to be a little bit better, um, but it still is uh, ED reducible. Um, and in particular, the commutative complexity scales is uh, n to the 1.77. Um, in any case, uh, none of these are, are close to n squared, which is what, uh, what we ideally want. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the same uh, general techniques apply to a host of other IMHF candidates. Uh, so there's some other follow-up work uh, looking at uh, Pomelo and uh, other variants uh, from the password hashing competition. Um, but uh, let me focus on argon 2i since it's the, the winner of the password hashing competition. Um, so what does argon 2i look like in terms of its gra graph structure? Uh, well, you start off with a chain, uh, one through n, and then for each node i, you pick a random predecessor, ri. Um, in the original version, this uh, random predecessor is chosen from the uniform distribution. Um, in the newest version, it's chosen from a slightly more sophisticated distribution. Um, but it turns out not to matter too much in terms of uh, the performance of our attack. Um, so here's how you would, for example, reduce the depth of an argon graph to uh, root n. Uh, first, we're arbitrarily going to partition these nodes into layers. Each layer has uh, n to the three-fourths nodes. Um, and now we're just going to uh, delete any node uh, in this uh, set S2. Um, so S2 is basically all nodes with a predecessor in the same layer. Um, so the claim, I'm not going to prove it, but just trust me, uh, S2 is pretty small. Um, well, what happens after you remove S2 from the graph? Uh, now each layer essentially becomes a path. Uh, and it turns out that it's pretty easy to reduce the depth of a path. Um, so now all we'll do is we'll reduce the depth of each layer um, since it's a path. Um, once we've reduced the depth of each layer to, um, let's say, fourth root of n, uh, then any path through the whole graph can stay in a single layer for at most fourth root of n steps. And there's fourth root of n, n layers, so the total depth of the graph would be square root n. All right, uh, so that gives us attacks in theory. Um, of course, this is a real world crypto conference. Uh, so uh, the question is, you know, are these just attacks in theory or uh, could they lead to uh, practical attacks for real memory parameters that, uh, that we might adopt? Um, and we would argue that the answer is yes. Um, so in particular, uh, for argon 2i uh, with uh, memory parameter 2 to the 20, um, so that's a gigabyte of memory, uh, which, is, uh, which is practical, um, we get attack quality um, exceeding uh, 5, and it's going to rapidly increase. So if you... Uh, you know, go up to just two gigabytes of memory, attack quality is gonna be almost 10, um, and it's gonna further increase as, uh, as memory increases. Um, so to, uh, to get this plot, we actually simulated our attack. Um, so instead of just plugging in the theoretical bounds, uh, we actually implemented the attacks, uh, um, generated some random argon uh, 2i graphs, and uh, just ran the attacks to see, uh, see what performance look, looks like. And, uh, and this is what you get. Um, now, I should mention I've had a, a, a graduate student uh, working this semester on some alternate heuristics, and I think these curves are actually going to shift left a little bit farther. Um, I don't have those results yet, but uh, if I had to make a wager, I think these curves are going to shift a little bit left, uh, which means that the attacks are going to be even more practical and at even smaller memory parameters. All right. Um, so I should also note that uh, even with the pessimistic uh, parameter settings, uh, so if you make six passes through a gigabyte of memory, uh, we, still, uh, we still get attacks. Uh, so you can still uh, reduce your cost by a factor of two, approximately. Um, of course, there are good reasons why you might not want to uh, make six passes over memory. Uh, 
in particular, users are impatient, and so you probably don't have time to make six passes over a gigabyte of memory. Um, all right. Uh, well, um, so this doesn't just apply to argon 2i. Um, in fact, we have a general theorem uh, stating that uh, ideal IMHFs don't exist. Um, and uh, simplifying a little bit, uh, we prove that any graph G with constant in degree is at least somewhat depth reducible. Um, so in particular, that implies that uh, there's always an attack with qual quality, um, oh sorry, this should be log n over log log n, not, uh, um, not the other way around. Uh, I'll fix that on my slides before I send it to you. Uh, but there's always an attack with quality roughly, uh, roughly log n. Um, all right, so this is uh, true in theory, uh, but we can actually can't rule out uh, ideal IMHFs in practice. Uh, so if you look at, uh, you know, the memory parameters for which these attacks start to become practical, they start to be practical somewhere around uh, 2 to the 51, uh, which is orders of magnitude uh, above any, uh, any real memory parameter that we, we would select. All right. Uh, so in the last uh, three to four minutes, uh, let me tell you about some exciting new results. Uh, not only is depth robustness necessary for a secure IMHF, uh, it's also sufficient. Um, in particular, if G is ED depth robust, uh, then the cumulative cost of pebbling is at least E times D. Um, so that's a pretty simple theorem statement. And uh, since this is a real world, uh, crypto conference, I don't have to be embarrassed and hide behind the simplicity of the proof. Uh, that's actually the entire proof. Uh, I won't walk through it, uh, but it fits in, uh, fits in a paragraph. All right, so what are the implications of this theorem? Uh, well, one implication is that there exists a constant in degree graph uh, with cumulative complexity scaling as n squared over log n. Um, so this beats the previous best construction due to Alwyn and Serbanenko, which gets uh, n squared over log to the 10 n. Uh, and uh, in fact, we can't really do better in an asymptotic sense uh, based on the last uh, attack that I showed you. Um, I should mention here uh, that the result from this paper, ABP 16, is definitely not practical yet, uh, but we do have some constructions that we're working on which uh, we believe will be practical. So uh, hopefully I'll have, uh, have some updates to share, share soon. Um, some other new results. Uh, so with this new technique, we can not only uh, upper bound the complexity of computing these IMHFs, we can also provide some lower bounds. Uh, so in particular, uh, for the latest version of argon 2i, uh, there's a lower bound. Uh, the cumulative complexity is at least uh, end of the 1.66. Uh, similarly for our balloon hashing. Um, S-crypt, uh, we're going to hear about uh, um, next lecture. It actually has a lower bound of n squared. Uh, so that's exciting, but of course S-crypt is uh, data dependent. That's uh, why our uh, upper bounds don't apply. Um, all right, so in conclusion, uh, depth robustness is necessary and sufficient uh, for building secure IMHFs. I think the big uh, challenge and one that I hope uh, people will be motivated to work on is improved constructions of depth robust graphs. Um, so the result in our paper re uh, really used uh, a result of Erdos, Graham, and Semeretti from 77. Uh, they're combinatorialists. They weren't particularly concer concerned with uh, practical uh, efficiency. Uh, but in this case, constants obviously matter a great deal. Um, more open questions. I think it would be cool to automate the cryptanalysis of IMHFs. Unfortunately, we have some results uh, that suggest this may not be possible. It's NP-hard to compute uh, CC of G. Uh, but we can't rule out heuristic approximation algorithms. Um, and of course, uh, there's still room for a tighter analysis of the latest version of argon 2i. There's a gap between the lower bound and the upper bound. Um, so with that, uh, I'll think. Uh, thanks for listening. In your t thanks. So several times in your talk, you um, emphasize that the in-degree delta has to be constant, mm -hmm. but surely it only has to be on, a, like on average order one for performance reasons, right? You only care how many hashes you're doing on average. So uh, 
like you said, the uh, naive thing that the honest user would do would just be keep all the pebbles in memory and never erase a pebble. Right. So if you just had a graph that was just one long chain and then the last node hashes everything you've ever seen together, mm. right? That gives you a constant uh, average in degree. And it, it seems to me that the, the uh, naive algorithm you suggest is the best you can do there. So um, what's wrong well, with that? Uh, OK. So uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so first of all, if, uh, um, if we're talking about average degree, uh, um, you can still reduce the depth of any, um, any graph with average, um, with constant average degree. The same, same result would apply. Um, now that example, yeah, but uh, you, you need all the pebbles right at the end. You need n pebbles in memory. <laughs> right. Um, so there is, uh, um, there would be a recursive way to evaluate. So take just the first chain, the n minus one uh, nodes. There would be a way to uh, kind of pebble all of those nodes with cost, uh, I believe, n times log n, um, kind of using a recursive uh, recursive approach. So. Really, your cumulative cost, uh, um, it's hard to um, prove this on the fly, but I believe the cumulative cost would actually be about uh, n log n to, okay. to evaluate that function. Of course, this is assuming that you can execute that last step uh, in like pseudo constant time, uh, right? If you have a hash value that, uh, that depends on everything, uh, everything previously, it seems like it's not really no, I assume Accurate that to takes treat that as an atomic uh, step, but yeah, yeah. it's a it's a good question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We have time for uh, one of the argon. <laughs> yeah, small comment from argon to designers, in particular, if you scroll back to the <laughs> plot with attack qualities. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that one. Yeah. Right. So for uh, real world uh, implementers, mm -hmm. some comments. So interesting on this <clears throat> plot, you see uh, argon two with different parameters. And mm -hmm. interestingly, uh, the ones at the bottom with the lowest attack quality are also slower than uh, and occup and take much memory within the, well less memory within the same time compared to upper ones. So if you want, uh, <coughs> when you increase this parameter tau, mm -hmm. you, in fact, the attack quality re it decreases slower than adversaries uh, brute force costs. So counterintuitively, it's uh, to maximize costs for adversary to brute force your passwords, it's better to use Argon 2 with highest attack quality, but not the lowest one. Yeah, no, that's, that's an excellent, uh, excellent point. So uh, um, there's two, uh, two criteria here. There's uh, um, attack quality, which measures the ratio uh, between the cost of the honest party and the cost of the attacker. Um, and because we're plotting attack quality here, um, this is hiding what the attacker's true, uh, true cost is. So if you wanted to maximize the attacker's cost, uh, you're actually going to um, pick this red line. Um, that means, of course, that the attacker is going to want to, want to run our, our algorithm because it gives him the, the highest advantage. Uh, but it also means that if you're, if you're the honest party and you're deploying this algorithm, your optimal thing is actually going to pick this to select the, the red option here. Yeah. Great. Why don't we thank uh, Jeremiah again.